Hey there, folks. I'm going to go ahead and turn this on and get us started. We're still waiting for a few people to show up. So uh, I hope you guys have had a good summer. Um, I know it's been challenging, uh, certainly in a lot of parts of the country. Um, just so you know, um, I'm in the upstate of South Carolina. That's a true zone seven. I'm in the western part of the state, Piedmont region, foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains. So when I talk about my garden, understand that's what I'm talking about, that kind of zone seven. You know, they used to be borderline zone six, but of course that's changed a little bit. So, and let me just check here. We are looking good. So let's go ahead and get started. So welcome everybody to this uh, Preparing Your Garden for Fall. Uh, my name is Paul Zimmerman. And I'd like to welcome everybody to this webinar on behalf of Jackson and Perkins. We're gonna cover a lot of stuff here. We're gonna to try to move it quickly and make it kind of fun and interesting. Um, so what are we gonna cover? Well, we're gonna talk about what is fall planning as opposed to winter planning. The two are very, very different. So keep that in mind. Um, we're gonna help your plants recover from the heat of summer. A couple little tips on that. Trimming and grooming to set up the fall flowers. And you guys are gonna learn what the Chelsea chop is and you're not gonna to wanna to miss that part. Um, feeding programs, what to use, when to start, and more importantly, as you see underlined right there on the screen, when to stop. That is so important with this kind of thing. Direct sowing seeds in the fall, what perennials to divide and move in the fall, and planning for spring. What is editing the garden? That's real important kind of stuff. So that's kind of the things we're going to cover. I got a couple demonstration videos for you as well. And at the end of the uh, presentation part of this, we're gonna be joined in a pre-recorded interview by two friends of mine, the hosts of Rose Chat Radio, Teresa Byington and Chris Van Cleve. Chris is in Alabama, Teresa's in Indiana. So we're talking, you know, warm weather part of the United States, cool weather part of the United States. We're gonna give you some practical hands-on, get your fingers in the dirt from Gardner's Tips. So you're gonna wanna stick around and see that as well. I think you're gonna find that very illuminating. So here we go. So before we begin, when does the fall growing season begin? That's real important to understand this. So plants go semi-dormant during a lot of summers. Now, if you're in zones four and five, you may not see this because summer tends to be your peak. But let's just say that when it gets really hot, you'll see the plants shut down a little bit. I always tell people, you know, you'll see them maybe taking a little bit less water in. Runs contrary to what you're thinking, but that's kind of when you're looking at that. So temperatures are the key as to when your fall season begins. Here's the key. The days can still be warm, but the nights turn cooler. So again, my zone seven, Piedmont region of the Carolinas, that happens around the middle of August. I might still see temperatures in the 90s and during the day, but in the evenings, they get down to the 60s. And that's that temperature swing. And that's that signal that the plants are starting to wake up and get going and get ready for fall and get into our fall blooming. So look at that. Just watch your temperatures. And when you see those nights turning cooler, you know your fall season's about ready to begin. So a couple of other things I wanted to talk about real quickly. So here's some nice midsummer grooming tips. Ideally, you would have done these already. If you did, don't panic. It's absolutely fine. Don't worry about that at all. Um, but for future years, this is a video that I did with Jackson and Perkins a number of years ago. It's on our Garden Inspired uh, Living channel on YouTube. So check that out. I even check it out now. You're going to pick up a couple little tips. You think, oh, I could probably still slip that in. So that's a good reference for the future as, as well as the uh, Garden Inspired Living Channel. You'll see all kinds of videos that kind of back a lot of this stuff up. So you want to check that out. So fall versus winter planning. What is the difference? Okay. Fall planning is setting your garden up for what is usually the second best bloom of the season after spring. Let me say that again the second best bloom of the season after spring. That's when the plants really start to fire up. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna increase feeding and watering as the growth rates picks up. Your eye, best way to check out your growth rate picking up. That's important to keep in mind. Watch the plants. They're starting to push new growth. You know fall is coming in. Groom the plants to encourage the next round of flowers. Chelsea Chop's coming into play. Divide certain perennials so they can settle back in before the winter. We're gonna go into which ones and why. And then sow fall seeds that need open air, cold temperature stratification. What is stratification? Very simply, they need that cold temperature and that moistness to basically break down the husk of the seed shell in order for the tender growth to push out in spring. Sometimes people do that in the refrigerator, but we'll go into more detail about that later. Those are some little things that we can do in the fall. So what's the difference between that and winter? 
Winter is setting your garden up for winter dormancy to make sure that the plants are asleep before those freezing temperatures come in. You don't want them growing actively when the temperatures freeze because as you probably realize, the interior of most plants through the stems and everything like that is liquid. There's liquid moving through them. And if it freezes, liquid freezes. What happens when liquid freezes? It expands. So if that's in here like this and it's liquid and it starts to freeze and it starts to expand, bloom. It bl blows your cell walls apart of the plant. So that's why we want to get them in the dormancy. That's a whole different beast. We stop the feeding to slow down the growth. We stop grooming to encourage dormancy. And then look for a future webinar. We'll get into a little more detail about this kind of stuff in a future webinar. But I just want you to understand the difference between getting ready for fall blooming, which is encouraging. We want to get the plants to grow and move. And also, what's the difference between winter when we want them to go quietly to sleep for the winter dormancy period? Okay, now that we've covered that. So first thing, we're coming out of summer. It's been hot. It's been, you know, humid in my part of the world. And, and I know, and certainly in the Western part of the United States, you guys have just been hammered this summer like nobody's business. I see you guys all over the Facebook and all kinds of stuff like that. So a couple things you want to do. Clean up the beds. I know this seems simple, but just, you know, get the old leaves, debris that's been hanging out. Roses will lose leaves a lot in the summer. Plants will lose leaves a lot in the summer. That's normal. It's part of the defensive system. Don't worry about that. Check your mulch levels. This is real important because mulch keeps the root zone moist and cool. And in the wintertime, uh, mulch can help keep the root zone warm and an even temperature and helps them from your frost damage. So just top up the mulch if you need a little bit of topping up. Don't do a whole new thick layer. Just kind of top it up a little bit, okay? And get the weeds out. Um, I know you're thinking, well, I've been weeding all summer, Paul. Well, no, we haven't. If it's been hot and humid, I've been a little behind on my weeding. So I'm going to get in there and get my weeds out so they're not competing for those temperatures or they're not competing for those food and all the fertilizer and all the good nutrients that are down in the soil. I want them all to go to the plants that I really want to have. So those are your basic tips to get her out of summer and start getting you set up to get into the fall. So trimming and grooming. This is the most important thing right out of the gate. Summertime, plants have suffered a little bit. They're kind of lax. They're kind of sleeping a little bit. So we want to just really get them going. We're going to start with the three Ds. Anytime you do any kind of grooming, pruning of your plants, I don't care what, the three Ds, dead diseased, dying, get them out, okay? Just get them out of there. That's the most important thing. This is a great opportunity to go ahead and get that taken care of. Go ahead and deadhead the plants if there's any blooms left over from summer that you haven't deadheaded. The deadheading encourages new growth a little bit quicker. So go ahead and take care of that. You can also reduce the plants. Some plants will get really big you know, during the summertime. You think, I'd like to get them down a little bit in the fall. This is a good time to do it. Most shrubs you can desert, reduce by about a third. Let me say that again. Most shrubs you can reduce by about a third. That's a good thing to keep in mind with that. And then many perennials will reflower if you cut them back. And that brings us to the Chelsea Chop. I can explain it to you, but I think I'd rather show it to you. So I'm going to drop a real quick pre-recorded video I did out in my own garden. Ladies and gentlemen, the Chelsea Chop. The Chelsea Chop is no more complicated than simply taking a perennial like this Echinacea, which by and large is finished at this point in time, and cutting it down about six inches high. Spurs new growth from the base. That's going to give me more flowering for the fall. So again, just take the plant. I'm just cutting the stems like this, as you can see. You know, I'm not making, I'm just making random cuts. I'm not worrying about getting it all the exact height. I'm just basically just chopping it off. And that's basically what I'm going to do. That's the Chelsea Chop in essence. Little tip for you. In the fall, don't do the Chelsea chop at the end of fall when these plants start to shut down. First of all, we don't want to spur new growth. More importantly, these are valuable for two reasons. One, these seed heads on Echinacea and a lot of perennials like this, lots of seeds for the birds, very important for that. Also, my beneficial insects are going to overwinter in what is called this rough foliage for the wintertime. So I will actually not cut these down until the spring and let them be a habitat for beneficial insects, food for birds for the winter. That's the Chelsea chop. I hope that cleared up what the Chelsea chop is. And more than anything else, I hope it gives you the, the fortitude or, or, the, or the nerve to say, okay, you know what? I can do this. I can take care of this because you will be rewarded by a very, very nice fall flowering as a result of the Chelsea chop. So let's talk about fall feeding because that's really, I think, the next thing that's important we need to chat about right here. So think feeding, as always, but not long-term. 
You'll hear me talk about, you hear other people talk about long-term time release fertilizers in the spring. Absolutely in the spring. I am all about it. But in the fall, our feeding window is narrower. Because remember when I talked about earlier, when winter comes, we want them to go to sleep. Well, if we're pushing fertilizer, they're not going to go to sleep. That's the important thing to keep in mind. So you can start increasing feeding, which sounds kind of weird, but they are going to get more hungry, really, as, as the nights turn cool and they start to push that new growth. They need energy. So you can increase the feeding. But use granulars. Um, you know, you can use some like instant granulars, you know, like a 10, 10, 10, maybe that's kind of going to come and go. But I really prefer liquids this time of year. You know, seaweed based, fish based are really excellent. So, but basically you want to provide nutrients, but you don't want it to go long-term. That's the key. So something that's going to feed, give it some food, but not a long-term for months on end, because we want to, like I said, they want to stop feeding so they can get ready for dormancy in the winter time. So that's what I'm talking about right there. So I hope that helps with the feeding. So again, feed, not long-term, try to use some liquids. That's really what I would advise you guys to do. When to start and when to stop is the most important thing that we're going to talk about here right now from the fall. Unlike spring, when you can just keep feeding, it's not an issue. In the fall, you need to know when to quit to allow them to go into that dormant period, like I talked about earlier. So you start when the nights start to turn cold. Talked about that earlier. That's when your fall's going. You're seeing growth starting to push. The plant's telling you, I'm waking up. I need to eat. I'm hungry. Go ahead and go on with that fall fertilizer program that we talked about. Short term, not long term. Fish uh, granular liquids are even better. Okay. So when do you stop? It's going to be totally variant depending on what part of the country you're in. Here's the key. What is the first frost date in your area? That's the first date that generally trends show that you can get a good frost or even a freeze. You want your plant shut down by then. You don't want them taking up active fertilizer. Okay, that's the important thing. Google your frost date by your zip code. Let me just show you what I'm talking about right here. I went to the old Farmer's Almanac page. See frost dates for your location. I plugged in a zip code, 40502. It says the first fall frost. You see it circled in red right there is October 21st. Six weeks before that is September 9th. That tells me that September 9th in zip code 40502 is when I'm going to stop any kind of fertilizer at all, including all liquids, shut it down. So again, there's a lot of sites like this. Farmer's Almanac's one of them. There's a bunch of them. Basically plug in your zip code. That's going to give you a good shot. Now you're going to know when. So again, it, it's all regional. Use your zip code. Find your first frost date. That cut, that's count back six weeks. That's when you shut down on the feeding. That's real important to keep that in mind. All right. So talk about some other things you can do. Now our plants are growing. We've got them set up, we've cleaned them, we've groomed them, we've got our fertilizer program going, we know when to quit, and we've got all that information going. So what are some other fun fall stuff we can do? Direct sowing seeds in the fall. Lots of things, larkspur, foxglove, things like that come to mind. They do really well. You know, Just take a look and do a little bit of research and you'll see varieties in your area, what will do well and things along those lines. So many seeds need cold tempers to germinate. They call that stratification. I mentioned that earlier. So in the wintertime, in the wild, so when a seed, you know, foxglove, I'm going to use that. They're called self-seeding biannuals, foxglove. They drop their seed, and generally after they flower, that's probably summertime is when they're generally done. Over wintertime, what happens, it's in the ground, and it's being the hard coating of the seed is being softened by frost and weathering action. And that's the whole thing about stratification. That's what they call it. This is called cold stratification. And so that's like a pretreatment. And what that does is that then basically softens that husk. And so that plant inside germinate can move and get through that husk in spring, basically when the temperatures tell it that it's time to wake up and get going and soak up the suns and nutrients. So that's what cold stratification basically is. That's why direct fall sowing for some seeds is actually a really, really neat way to go. So how do you do this? Well, you direct sow them in the ground. By that, I mean, you're sprinkling them in the ground. You're not chucking them out like that. You want to kind of use proper spacing and things like that and kind of drop them in. You don't have to dig individual holes. I just kind of sprinkle them around in an area, whatever size area you want that to be. And then I'll just take some potting soil and kind of put it on top. If it says to cover it a quarter of an inch, I'm going to cover a quarter of an inch, half an inch, half an inch. Whatever this package tells you to do, that's what you're going to want to cover with. 
give us some water to kind of settle it all in. I then take markers, bamboo stakes. I use those flags, those little kind of irrigation flag, marker flags, and I'll kind of mark off the area. That lets me know where my seeds are because <laughs> this has happened to me. Come spring, I'll go, I've got to plant a new plant there. And I'll have forgotten that I put seeds in there. So that tells me what areas to avoid in the spring until those seeds start to germinate. It also tells me what areas in the spring to avoid when I start to mulch if they haven't germinated yet, because I don't want to mulch on top of them. That's going to suppress their growth. So that's basically what it is. You can mulch around them, but after they germinate and start to come up, then you can go ahead and sprinkle some mulch in after the fact. So that's essentially direct sowing seeds. Really nothing more complicated than that. It's really simple, but it's very rewarding, very easy to do. You'll have a lot of fun. With it. So what else can you do in the fall? Well, you can divide some perennials. Dividing perennials. Dividing perennials is just taking an existing plant. You, you literally dig it out of the ground. You take a sharp shovel. They're all uh, direct perennial dividing knives I've seen. And you basically cut that root ball is basically what you do. And then you end up with a whole bunch of new plants that you can basically plant all over the area. It also stops the plants that are spreading too much. For me, Napita or catmint is one that really can kind of get wildly out of control. And I'll just periodically trim it back that way. You can also rejuvenate the plant that way. So I know that sounds a little bit, okay, what are you doing? You're dividing the plant, I can be rough with it. What can I do? Well, you know what? I love video. And I think that's what we're gonna go to right now. I did a pre-recorded video as well on dividing perennials. So let's pop over and have a look at that right now. Dividing perennials is exactly what it sounds like. Dividing a perennial, it's really no more complicated than that. The first step you wanna do is cut this thing down to the ground. You can see by the plant that I've got down beneath me at my feet, that's what I've done. I've cut it down about that high. The reason for that is I want the tops to be equivalent to the root zone when I dig that root zone up, because by digging it up, I'm gonna decrease the size of that root zone. My tool of choice is simply this. It's a, called a poacher spade. It's a long, thin spade. I really like it, but whatever works for you is correct. There's no really right or wrong tool in that sense. So the first thing we're gonna do is dig this thing up. Just basically circling the plant with this spade, tipping it out of the ground as I go. And that basically then, as you can see, this is an echinacea. There you go. That basically was it. I've dug up this clump of echinacea is what I've dug up. As you can see, now my top's about as close as my root ball. The next step is going to be divide it, set it back down on the ground. And I'm just going to kind of go through this plant and try to find a nice clean line where I can get through it. I'll tip this towards the camera a little bit. I got a nice clean line right there without a lot of woody stems. I'm going to take this poacher spade, begin to just gently insert it through the plant, like so. Nice clean cut. And as you can see, what was one plant is now two. That's it. That's dividing perennials. No more complicated than that. So I hope that was helpful in terms of what dividing perennials is all about. So here's the thing, what perennials can you move in the fall and what perennials can you not move in the fall? This is the best rule of thumb that you see on the screen right now that I've ever, ever heard or found, okay? If the perennial blooms in the spring, you can divide and move it in the fall. If the perennial blooms in the fall, divide and move it in the spring. So basically divide and move during the season, they are not flowering. For your summer flowering perennials, I generally tend to move those in the fall. I find that works a little bit better for me that's further from spring. The key, however, to all of this with the perennials is make sure you divide them early enough so when you do plant them, they have that period to get their roots established before your frost date comes in, okay? So again, what is your last first, what is your first frost date, okay? If your first frost date's the middle of October and you're, you're six weeks before September 9th, you want all those perennials divided and moved by six to eight weeks before your first frost date in the fall. That's basically what you want to do. The next thing I want to talk about is editing the garden, planning for spring, because even though we're in fall and we're planning for fall, let's, let's think ahead a little bit. Let's think to spring, which I know cheers all of us up as gardeners. So a couple of things, edit the garden. What plants didn't work? If it didn't work, you know, grab a shovel, get it out of there. Give it two or three years, but after a while, it, it's just not a plant for your garden. Doesn't mean it's a bad plant. Maybe it just means it's not a good plant for you and your particular garden. So that's something that you don't want to do. Think about moving plants or, you know, if, if a plant's getting too tall on the front of the border, I'll 
for me personally, a plant that I adore, Agastache Blue Fortune. I thought it was going to get two and a half, three feet. It's almost five feet. I'm going to be dividing those up as I talked about dividing. I'm going to go ahead and move them to the back of the border while I'm doing the dividing. That's a great opportunity to take advantage of that. That's going to give me that more classic border tiered effect. If you know, lower plants in the front, then my mid border is my medium plants. My tall plants are in the back. So I've kind of got that stadium effect as I'm looking at the plants. This is a great opportunity to do some edits in that way as well. And if you've taken plants out, you've got plant or plants have died, you've got stuff you got to get in. You know, after your first frost date, when winter's settling in, now's the time to grab a cup of hot tea, sit by the fire, pop the seed catalogs in your lap or on your iPad or whatever you've got, and take a look and see what's out there, you know, or start ordering your plants for spring. Get orders in early. You know, planting and gardening has exploded during this time. So make sure you get your ordering in early, start thinking about what else you want to get in. And those are kind of your nice winter chores. And that kind of covers the basics of what I wanted to talk about, about setting your plants up for fall and getting that really nice fall flowering in, which is just such a wonderful time of year to enjoy the flowers. The temperatures are cool. It's nice to be back out in the garden again. And so again, that's some presentation stuff. So what about some practical hands-on? As I mentioned at the beginning of this, I was sat down, uh, did a pre-recorded interview with my uh, good friends from uh, Rose Chat Radio, uh, Teresa Byington and Chris Van Cleve. And we basically chatted about some of the practical things you can do. So here we go. Meet Chris and Teresa. Teresa and Chris, it is so glad to welcome you on behalf of Jackson and Perkins. And Teresa, say hey to the folks. Hey, everybody. Chris, say hey to everybody. Hey, good morning from Alabama. So I know you all better uh, as friends, obviously very good friends of mine, but also know you guys through Rose Chat Radio, which you guys are the hosts and brains behind. And the link is on the screen. And folks, if you've not listened to the Rose Chat Radio podcast, please do, um, because there is new episodes and old episodes of archive that goes back several years. Um, and it's just a treasure trove of wonderful interviews and information and practical hands-on tips. And speaking of which, that's what this segment's about, which we pre-recorded for this webinar, because I've given you all some theory, but now we're going to get some hands in the dirt with two very experienced gardeners. And Chris is from Alabama, which, of course, is warm weather. Teresa's from Indiana, which, of course, is cooler weather. So we're going to cover both sides of the United States. And, Teresa, I want to start with you because your fall is, is certainly shorter than Chris's is and certainly shorter than mine is. So when you start honing in on fall, what comes to your brain? Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is I'm one of those people who doesn't like fall. That's not something you can tell everyone, you know, of course I'm telling everyone right now, but I don't like fall. You know, when you live in Indiana, winters come quickly, they stay a long time and they are very dark and nothing is growing. Of course, the nice snow, you know, sometimes it's pretty, but so if you don't like fall, then you need an attitude adjustment about it as a gardener because you're coming off of July and there's bugs, Japanese beetles, and it's hot. And you're thinking, do I even want to be a gardener anymore? so hot but two years ago i think someone sent me a card and on the card it said autumn is the second spring i like I can that get a lot autumn is the second spring what a wonderful way so so how did that adjust your attitude when you read that and you went did you did you look at it from as, as a from from as opportunity Absolutely. But in enjoyment, for one thing, it's because I'm going to do the things I'm going to do. But just knowing, I mean, no one loves spring more than I do. I count the days till spring, starting the day after Christmas. And I love spring. I love everything about it, even the rain, even the mud. I just love it. It's fresh. It's new. We're ready to go. So I get ready to go. About the third week of July, I'll look at the roses. I start trimming them back. For spring i fertilize them their last fertile uh, fertilizer and then i cover them with a beautiful fresh coat of mulch is there anything better seriously than putting down the mulch and getting ready for roses to bloom so attitude i was going to do it anyway but i feel so and i was going to enjoy it anyway but it's so much more fun to think of it as the second spring I love that autumn is the new spring. And Chris, 
you know, you're in Alabama, as, as we talked about, and, and while Teresa has a shorter fall, you have a much longer summer and you have a southern rather intense summer. So, so when you start getting thinking about, OK, now we're getting ready for my fall, which you have a longer fall, what sorts of come to your mind? Well, well, number one, uh, SEC football for one. <laughs> <laughs> Teresa, Teresa hates fall. I love fall because it has just been so hot all summer. You know, we have temperatures in the uh, upper nineties every single day and humidity to match. Uh, by the time you know late September, October, which is really when our fall begins in in central Alabama. Um, you know, I'm ready for those cooler temperatures. And it's a much better experience in the garden. Uh, you know, it, during the summer months, if if I don't get my gardening chores done by 7 a.m., it's not happening that day. It's just too hot. So, you know, I, I, I love and welcome those cooler temperatures. Yeah, and I think in the fall, in the summertime, too, because I'm in, I'm in the upstate of South Carolina, so I'm kind of in between a little bit. I get some mountain, but... You know, Teresa, you mentioned about, you know, fall, uh, late summers when you go through, you groom your roses, groom your plants, perennials, whatever it is. You know, Chris, I'm sure you're doing the same. I'm doing the same. So then let's talk about fertilizing a little bit, just from some practical as aspects about that, you know. So when do you start fertilizing for to get your fall bloom going? And then what do you use? What works best for you? Chris, let's go ahead and start with you. Sure. Well, I, you know, now is the time for, for me to begin to apply my final fertilizers of the year. Usually about six weeks prior to the first predicted frost date. And, you know, here in Alabama, that, that first frost can run anywhere from October to February. <laughs> it just, <laughs> just sort of depends. So, you know, at some point you have to kind of set a line and say, okay, the cooler temps start, you know, in, in October. So let's back that up. So I am now applying my, my last fertilization of the year. And uh, yeah, I use a variety of different types of fertilizers. It runs from organic to inorganic fertilizers and use a lot of composted manures. Um, you know, use, uh, of course, Annie's Moopoo tea works, works wonders in the garden, but, you know, a lot of uh, composted cow and horse manure and, um, you know, and then I, I mix that up uh, over the season with, you know, just an all purpose 10, 10, 10. Yeah, and the good thing about those compost is you're also feeding the soil at the same time you're feeding the plants themselves. And that's that, that's that nice balance of, of getting those two things going. Um, right. so yeah, so I think your point, your takeaway, I think, from you, particularly with fertilizer, is, you know, is you can fertilize, but know when to stop. And, Teresa, I mean, so folks in the northern climate where winter comes on you so much faster, you know, what, what practical tip can you give to our folks up north saying, this is when I know it's time to stop fertilizing? Well, right now I'm giving the last fertilizer. So by the 1st of August, you should be done because we are definitely going to have frost by October 10th or so. So, you know, Chris starts about the same time, but he's got a big window. We don't. It is going to frost. Even if we don't have a cold winter, we're going to we're going to get it real quickly into October. So, Chris said the 6 weeks, you want to count those dates back. And so I want to just pivot to something else here real quickly. And I think this is real important, and this is deadheading, um, and not just roses, deadheading perennials. So, Teresa, I want to start with you. When do you stop deadheading? Early September. Um, this is the last bloom cycle, and when they finish blooming, they just finish completely for winter. It's time to set hips. It's time to, to go into their seed formation because they need time to go to sleep. If we keep fertilizing, we keep deadheading. As we know, deadheading and pruning tell our plants to wake up, let's, let's bloom some more. And while I want to do that, and I don't like to see the dead heads, I do like to see the hips, but not the dead heads. They just look so sad and forlorn and lonely and uncared for, but I know it's best because if you send them into a hard winter with a weak, you know, stems that are trying to produce a flower instead of stems that have gone to sleep, um, that's just a recipe for, for disaster. Yeah, and you have to. I totally agree. And, and Chris, so, you know, for folks in your part of the world, the more southern part of the United States, you know, where, like you said, I mean, you could have, you know, your first frost could be October, it could be February. So what are some of your practical tips of saying, okay, I need to now, let, like Teresa said, let the roses and the plants go to sleep? 
Right, right. Well, I try to just maintain the same schedule every year and do that final uh, fertilization in August. And I do some other things in the garden in August that are going to give me a final flush of bloom in October. So when that when that final flush, flush of bloom occurs, I will cut back the spent blooms and uh, allow uh, the roses then to go into what I call that semi-dormant state for the year. Yeah, that makes the most sense. I do this about the same thing. I'll, I'll, I will go ahead and do a nice trim and I'll do, I'll do maybe one round of deadheading, you know, when they start to get for fall. But then, like you said, you got to let them go semi-dormant. So yeah. listen, those are some great tips with fertilizing and deadheading. And so now I'm just going to come to you. And Chris, I'm going to go ahead and start with you. And then Teresa, I'm going to come to you. So Chris, if you could just tell other folks in your area, you know, what are some other things that you've learned over the years gardening in Alabama that, that, that you think are important for fall? Well, I, I think being a good housekeeper in the garden is really important. Uh, keeping your, your beds clean. If you've got diseased leaves, you know, debris that's blown into the garden, it's really important to now is the time to clean all that out. With, you know, most rose diseases being mold borne uh, in nature, if those fall to the ground, they're going to be, that mold's going to be there in the spring and will cause you problems. So, you know, I've cut out at least 50% of the disease issues in my garden by just keeping the garden clean. Uh, well, that, that, that's a big tip because, again, you're in the South where disease pressure can be rather unique with your heat and humidity you talk about in the summer. So, yeah, good housekeeping seems like a, just a great way to just make sure that that garden's going to be set up for, for, for spring as well as fall. Oh, yeah. Yeah. One of the other things I do that I think is really important is I do a, you know, people say fall pruning and I call it a wind pruning. You know, we, we have especially hybrid teas and some of the other roses that will grow extremely tall uh, in the summertime. And a lot of our shrub roses will throw out, you know, very long canes. I, I'll do what I call a wind pruning that I will cut those back to about waist high. And, and that what that does over winter, uh, when the winter winds come and rock your shrubs back and forth, it's going to help prevent some of that wind rock, which can damage your roots and your canes and ultimately could kill the plant. So that's a great tip, actually. Yeah, I've heard about people doing that because, because you know, as you've noticed, and Teresa, I'm sure you've seen it as well. You know, when when that cool temperatures in the night come in in, in late summer, early fall, the amount of growth or basal breaks that you can get from the base of your plants can be enormous. Yeah. And so, Teresa, well, you know, give us a couple of tips for folks up north that you think, OK, here's just, you know, some good practical other things that you can maybe doing in the fall to either, you know, again, set the fall up or maybe start getting ready for spring. <laughs> well, one thing I definitely want to mention, because we've talked a lot about pruning our roses and waist high, and, and, and Chris is spot on on that, but I have a lot of climbers, and I have a lot of old garden roses, and we are not going to treat them the same way. Yeah. We, we need those old garden roses just to stay the way they are, because they've already decided how they're going to bloom next spring, so we don't want to tamper with that. But one of the things that I have to do, and I usually do it in late October, November, it's usually like a really cold day when I say, okay, this is the time. But my climbers, my Peggy Martin, some of my climbers, they are throwing out 20, 30 foot canes. And I just jump up and down because that means, oh, that's gonna fit all the way across the trellis. Or, oh, <laughs> we were tying up one a little bit yesterday. So I just see them and I know I'm gonna start, I'm, I'm gonna start tying them in place for bloom. Where do I want to see them bloom? And we want to get them as horizontal as we can because that's going to send up all those vertical blooming shoots. So a big part, it, you know, it takes me a day at least, and but it's so worth it. You know, when you see those those climbers bloom, I mean, they just can really make the garden. So at least in my garden, it, it really depends on that beautiful bloom. So I'm gonna take really good care not to touch the old garden roses and really good care to tie up beautifully just the way I want them to look in the, in the spring bloom time, um, my climbers. Yeah, and I think that's a great part what you talk about. That's a great thing of thinking ahead. It's not just the season winding down, in a weird way, it's the next season starting because um, you're really setting your garden up for what's going to happen next season. And I want to just 
do one more real quick thing because you always hear people say one way or the other about this it's good or it's not good so we're gonna do a quick speed round here and uh trace i'm gonna start with you and then chris i'm gonna let you get the last word on this subject and that's fall planting a lot of people say you should not do fall planting so Teresa, you're in a northern climate where people it even gets almost more controversial so what's your take on fall planting um you know, I'm always going to try to push the seasons and I'm always going to try to do as much as I can until I simply can't. But I will tell you that I don't have as good of luck. You know, I have to know that I might not see you in the spring. So I can't, I, I, something that I'm going to count on, I'm going to say, I'll see you next year. We'll get you next year because we just, we might have a mild winter, but we might really have the polar vortex up here. So, so not a lot of success with that here. Okay, Chris? Well, uh, I think it's absolutely a great idea in the deep south to, <laughs> to plant in the fall. Uh, you know, once when October gets here, I, if I plant roses in the fall, it's in the month of October. You know, that gives us a couple of months before any really, you know, cold temperatures of any significance uh, arrive. And, you know, that's, that's plenty of time for that rose to begin to put down some, some roots and to take hold and it can hold its own through an Alabama winter. You know, I tell folks, uh, I travel around the country, you know, we only have uh, you know, about four days of winter in Alabama and it's not four days in a row. So, <laughs> you know, we'll have a snow in January and then, you know, it'll snow again in February, but in, in between it's 60 degrees every day, so. Yeah, I think the same thing. I mean, if, if you live in an area where your winters are milder, like I'm in zone seven, Chris, I'm just going to say you're probably zone eight, maybe nine. Uh, eight, 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 yeah. Yeah, eight, eight, so, and I'm zone seven. And I think even probably even push the portions of zone six, you can push it. And I think one of the things I want to leave the folks in the webinar watching this uh, to keep in mind, even though the air temperatures may be cool in these zones, the soil temperatures can still be warm. And that's what's pushing the root growth. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. So when you do that fall planting. Personally, I love fall planting in my climate as well. It works absolutely great. So, so folks, this, this has been great, Chris and Teresa. Um, you know, uh, we're, you know, autumn is the new spring, Teresa. I love that thing. And so, you know, thank you so much for joining me on this webinar. And again, on behalf of Jackson Perkins, to the folks of Rose Chat Radio, thank you so much. I want to thank Teresa and Chris for joining me on this webinar, and I hope you found some of their information useful and more so practical. Uh, I really did like Chris's tip on pruning in the fall for wind rock, uh, bringing the roses or plants down by about a half to prevent them from getting torn around by those winter winds. That's a great useful tip that I've heard a lot of people use. So that basically brings us to the my portion of, of teaching you part of the, this webinar. And uh, I put some review notes up on the screen there, so you can kind of take a look at those to review what we covered and uh, hopefully you'll find that useful as well and you all had a couple of questions and I want to go ahead and grab those right now and we'll conclude by uh, answering the questions so first one I got one from James here hello James how you doing um, I live in Denver and we've had a really hot summer I know you touched on some tips but what about us at altitude that's a great question James um, altitude itself isn't going to really make much difference what I think you need to be aware of at altitude is Things like fall are going to come sooner. Maybe your winter is going to be a little bit more severe. So remember when I talked about Googling your zip code to find your first frost date? That's where I would advise you to be very specific with that zip code. If nothing else, even talk to some master gardeners in your area or something like that. Because, you know, altitude can be, you know, you know 10,000 feet somewhere else or 6,000 feet somewhere else. And then maybe 10 miles away, it's, it's half that. And that can be a big difference. So just be hyper aware of what your very specific area is at altitude. Other than that, just do everything that I basically talked about doing. So I hope that helps, James. And thanks again for bringing the questions to us. Uh, let's see, Lori from Ohio. Hello, Lori from Ohio. Welcome, welcome, welcome. First timer here. I love first timers. I love talking to first timers. This is great. I planted my roses and nothing happened. What should I do? Um, oh, they were they were bare root when you planted them. Okay, first of all, this happens sometimes with plants, bare roots in particular, um, when they're in cold storage, which is a long overwintering period in a in a locker that's basically sprayed with water, kept it at, at a temperature of like 33 degrees. And I realized that was a rose geek out moment, but we're going to have those every now and then in these webinars. 
Um, they need certain storage to come out of, or, or energy to come out of that dormancy kind of period or storage period. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It's not your fault, not the grower's fault. It's no one's fault. It just happens. So what I would advise you to do, if you get a plant and you see it's not performing well, the very first thing is contact customer service. Uh, you know, our, certainly Jackson Perkins, we have a call center that you can touch into. Record that your rose isn't doing well. Take photographs, et cetera, et cetera. Stay in touch with customer service. And at the end of the day, if the rose isn't doing well, they're going to be certain to take care of you. So just document it. Um, but, you know, outside of the normal watering, don't do heavy feeding with a furrows that you get initially. Use a light hand, maybe a Fisher fertilizer. That's about it. But just keep an eye on the plant. If it's not doing well, get a hold of customer service, take pictures, document it, and make sure you get in touch with us. Okay? Thanks. I appreciate it. Uh, Rebecca from Washington. Hello up in Washington. You have had some odd weather, Rebecca. Holy moly, you guys have been on a roller coaster up in Washington State. So. What's in your garden? <laughs> Rebecca, that sounds like a Capital One commercial right there. Um, what is in my garden? Gosh, that's a great question. You know, my garden is an odd garden. I'm going to be honest with you, Rebecca. It, it fluctuates from year to year. I have some roses, particularly old garden roses. Remember Teresa talking about those that are old favorites of mine that I've always had? Because that, that is my heart is, is with the old garden roses, even though I love all modern roses. Then I get a lot of test roses that move through my garden on a constant basis. I have a lot of perennials and here, and you know, here's a little tip that I'll give you for folks like myself who have a lot of in different kinds of roses and roses are constantly moving in and out of the garden on a regular basis. So I can't really plan a color scheme or something like that. So what I do is I have a perennial plant palette. I think I got that right, perennial plant palette about seven or eight, maybe 10 perennials that I work with. I try to work with whites, blues, because there are no blue roses, um, and also colors that, that kind of complement the roses, but don't clash with the roses, no matter what color um, spectrum those roses actually are. I then move those and plant them through the entire garden. So I'm repeating my perennials over and over and over and over again, that palette that I've got. And that's what basically ties my garden together and holds all those diverse roses in. So you're going to see in my garden roses, you're going to see perennials, you're going to see bulbs. And yes, I grow my tomatoes in my garden. And I'll tell you right now, the greatest tip I ever got was to do that because I used to have, you know, tomato hornworm and things like that. Since I started putting them with all my other plants, the birds take care of them. I don't have those issues anymore. And, you know, it's, I love having that kind of thing in there as well. So that's basically what's in my garden. It's a combination of all kinds of things. And mainly it's just stuff that I love. That, my garden comes from here, really not from here most of the time. So I hope that helps a little bit. But, you know, I'm going to leave you with this, uh, Rebecca. Here's the end of the day. It's your garden. So what's in your garden is correct for your garden. Okay. So don't take off what's in my garden or someone else's garden or a garden you see somewhere or something like that. Be brave, be bold. It's your garden. You know what? Do what you want. There's no right or wrong. Have fun. That's the whole point of gardening. And I bring in that. I hope that this webinar was enjoyable for you. I hope you learned some things as well. It's been great spending time with you. I love doing this kind of stuff. You all know that. And if you have questions, you know, follow us up on, you know, our Facebook page, Jackson and Perkins. That's a great place to pop into. I would also advise you just grab it on our email list. Go ahead and get on that. See our, uh, go to our website, jacksonperkins.com. You'll get news about future webinars, promotions, things along those lines. And that's the end of the commercial right here now. But I do want to make sure you stay in touch with us because we're going to be doing more of these kind of educational sessions and bringing gardening and making it relaxing to you. So on behalf of Jackson Perkins, I'm Paul Zimmerman. And thanks for spending time in the garden with us.